Welcome to tonight's program, The Late Show. If you're watching as a repeat, remember that this is the 27th of November. We're almost at the end of the year. But we want to say a big thank you to Derek Walker. Pastor Derek Walker from the Oxford Bible Church has joined us again this evening. Hello, Howard. Good you to do. be here. Yeah. Well, there's going to be a plenty of opportunity for you tonight to put your questions to Pastor Derek because <coughs> he's a, a well-known Bible scholar. And uh, if you're wanting to know more about particularly what we call eschatology or the end times, uh, of the known world as we know it today, Jesus said he was going to be coming back again at the end of an age. So if you want to ask when that is and how it's going to happen, uh, and you want to ask any other specific questions, please do email us in live at revelationtv.com and obviously the text, we can take those texts with you. Do get your questions in early because we never seem to get through them all, no matter how quickly we try to um, put them up to Derek. But uh, let's let's first of all ask you, Derek, um, anything new since we last met? Anything special happening apart from your birthday My today? My birthday is today. Oh, yesterday, so, uh, right. Just turned 30. 49? <laughs> <laughs> 1949, I mean. No, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's 1959, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just 10 years now. What's 10 years when you get this old? Exactly. Yeah. You lose count after a bit. <laughs> you hope to. All right. Anyway, <coughs> so you don't lose count of what's going on. You need to be aware of the signs of the times. And what are they? Well, Pastor Derek will be uh, answering the questions. And our first one that's come in from Gary. Thank you, Gary, for being so organized tonight. I did mention on my Facebook that uh, Pastor Derek was going to be with me and to put your questions in. So uh, at least one person's responded. So well done, Gary. Right, now. If I get rid of that sign that's obliterating it, I don't know why that's coming on there, but well, let's see. It's a, there you go, it's a sign of the times. <laughs> okay, it's gone. Uh, question for you guys. What are your views on Revelation 12 sign? Let me just uh, give some of the background because I know okay. you might know all this right off the bat, but uh, to our viewers who might be uh, less informed, let's have a, a little read of what Gary uh, Scott Chur is actually saying. On September the 23rd, 2017, a sign forms in the heaven that fits the requirements of Revelation 12. And as far as can be determined from computer models, this is the only time this sign will occur in history. Therefore, this would literally be the great sign of Revelation that, that is to appear in heaven. The woman in heaven is Virgo, the virgin. The sun is the sun clothing Virgo, and the moon is actually under her feet. The garland of 12 stars are the nine stars of Leo with three wandering stars. Sounds like the other singer, doesn't it? That have been situated within Leo, Leo at this time to make up the 12. Those wandering stars are Mercury, Mars and Venus. And the last element of the sign is that the Virgin must be with child. The planet or star of the Messiah is Jupiter. Jupiter at this time is the womb of Virgo. Obviously, the rapture did not happen. But what do you think uh, it may have signified, asks Gary? Yes, I mean, I have to say I had to deal with a number of people because this became quite popular on YouTube. So I was trying to persuade them before it would happen that this, of course, is not, that there's nothing to this. It's just that people have been quite clever in trying to make something of it. Um, if you're experiencing these things, you're, you're sometimes not so easily impressed, you know, when people put things together. Um, I have written a book called, if somebody's interested, signs in the heavens and I deal with all the signs in the heavens in the Bible and uh, I actually cover you know the the actual biblical fulfillment of that uh, perhaps it would be a good idea just to quickly read uh, Revelation 12 now a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars then being with birth, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. And his true tail drew a third of the stars of the heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations, with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Literally take the whole program to deal with this properly. But basically this uh, is talking about the birth of Christ and how Christ the will be- birth, in the sense- in Yes, the, the first coming of Christ. Right. And then the pro as often happens with prophecies, there's prophecies of the first coming and then it jumps to the second coming. And the, of course the child is raptured to the throne, that the, ascends to the throne and that is of course his ascension. Mm -hmm. And then the prophecy does jump into the end times. 
And people, for a start, have biblically misinterpreted that and tried to apply this sign to the end times. And I show, following the work actually of Dr. Martin, that in fact this sign was fulfilled at the birth of Christ. Um, so what part of that <coughs> is actually dealing with the, uh, the, com the second coming of Christ? None of it. None of it? Okay. No, it's a total red herring. Right. And I was telling people before this, it's, do it's not a sign of the rapture. So why is it because they thought the rapture of the man, the man child rapture, you see, that's the rapture of the church. So, but, but apart uh, from anything else, the rapture is signless. There, okay. there will be no sign for the rapture. It's an imminent event. It could happen any time. But what about the fact that in the beginning of Revelation, it says these are the things that must shortly take place. Yes. So, and yes, John was given those words in around 96 AD. Yes. What that, what's going on here? Um, is that you have, generally, Revelation is future events after chapter 4, absolutely. But sometimes characters are introduced. I mean, even mm. here, the dragon, it says, who, who took a third of the angels with him. The demons. See, that's giving character right. background. Right. And here, the, the, you know, it's all about Christ in the end, but background is given on Christ. So you like know, that he was born to rule history, the nations, yeah. he will be born, he will ascend into heaven. That gives the background, and then we move into the end times. And so it doesn't, so in this case, it's just a bit of character background. Right. And in fact, the sign was fulfilled in two, a Tabernacles 2 BC, or tr Trumpets 2 BC, while uh, Mary was in childbirth. Um, so all those Because signs. the moon was under the feet. Yeah. Um, the sun, the Virgo was clothed with the sun. Now that wasn't not fulfilled this month. Um, Virgo was um, Virgo, which represents the woman. That's fair enough. The, you know, the one who will give birth. It give, really represents Israel, this woman. But Mary, of course, is, has a very special place in that. That the Messiah came through Israel and through Mary in particular. And then in the end times, we see this woman fleeing to the wilderness. That's that's Israel in the tribulation will be fleeing to the wilderness. But, um, you know, in, in, this, in September, of course, the rapture didn't happen. I thought nobody would bring this up again because it's clearly been discredited. You know, it's pointless having a sign when nothing happens on the sign. It's clearly, you know, a false we, sign. we've obviously misinterpreted it. Right. But um, what happened is that Virgo was not, she was not clothed with Virgo in that case. The sun was kind of near Virgo or, or down below at her feet, but not clothed with Virgo. And all the excitement is about a few planets passing through. And the point is, with the crown, a crown is a permanent feature. So whatever the, cr the crown of 12 stars is above Virgo's heads, that's been identified. You know, I have that in my book. You know, there, it's a fairly faint crown, but there are, you can select a, a group of 12 stars above Virgo's head. It's no good saying, well, that's uh, Mars and I can't remember which Venus. ones it is, um, that kind of because it's all very arbitrary if you look into these things. They, they take the nearby constellation that's actually quite a way away and say, oh, that's got nine stars. Well, in some star atlases, it's got 10 stars or 11 stars, you know, and so, oh, it's the first time ever that, it's, that there's nine stars and three, but it's arbitrary. You, you could say that constellation had eight stars or, or 11 stars, you know, it depends which book How you look at. Oh, right. And so they say, this, but in any case, these moving stars, the wandering stars, that can't be the crown because a crown is something that's fixed in place. So all this stuff about Mars, Jupiter and all that, that's not in the Bible, that's, there's no reference. If, if that's important, it would be in the scripture. In any case, it's taking the scripture out of context. It's, it was a sign that was fulfilled at the birth of Christ. I show that in my book. And for um, those who want to get hold of the book, if you go to the website... OxfordBibleChurch.co.uk, I go into it in detail how that was fulfilled at the birth of Christ, because God did do a sign in the heaven at his birth, just like he did a sign in the heaven at his crucifixion. You know, the sun turned to darkness and the moon turned to blood at his crucifixion. Yeah. And so there was a sign in the heavens at his birth, but we're taking scripture out of context. The sign doesn't say it, the sign happened you know, when the grandchild was raptured, it says that the sign happened when the child was born. Right. So that's the birth of Jesus. And, and some of them even went crazy and said, well, there's a sense in which um, the church will be born or something out of Israel. Mm. You know, you, you, you get nonsense if you look at it closely. Uh, Marcus writes in on the back of that question, the previous question is, uh, what is your prediction then for when the rapture will happen? 
Well, like I said, the rapture, to be absolutely biblical, the rapture is imminent, which means it could happen at any time. I, I call it God's secret. God has deliberately kept it. See, if you read 20, Matthew 24, when he's talking about the rapture, he says it in many different ways. He says, no one knows the day and the hour. And then he says, in a more stronger way, he says, the Son of Man will come at a time when you do not think he will. And then another time he says, watch out because your Lord is coming. Your Lord, even Christians don't know, your Lord is coming at a time when you do not expect him. And if you read it, it says four or five times what I call imminence verses. And Jesus, uh, which means that there are no signs. We'd like to know, of course, but there's no way we can know because God doesn't tell us. And the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, three times, verse 7, 12, and 20, Jesus says, I'm coming soon. But what that actually means is, I'm coming suddenly. Mm. So quickly, in the twinkling of an eye. In other words, we'll be sitting here one second, we'll be gone in our resurrection bodies. And there'll be no notice, there'll be no warning, there'll be <laughs> no nice kind if of we go now. 10 days to rapture. Right. Everyone start repenting. Right. 10 days to rapture. It won't be like that. No. There won't be a warm feeling coming across our body. Oh, I think something's about to happen. It's just gonna happen. Yeah. And that means we have to stay ready all the time. Yeah, which also means it's like that program on television where the boss uh, gets dressed up as a somebody or nobody <laughs> and comes in and works amongst yeah. his workers, yeah. sees where everybody's heart and intentions are and uh, the motives for them uh, in the, in the <clears throat> workplace. Jesus really is already watching us yes, closely among, now. Exactly. I mean, people, uh, you know, Christians, you, you, you can tend to forget and think, well, I can just do this, that, and the other. You know, so we need to be paying attention to, the, uh, you know, the way w we are acting and, and, and our, 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 our particular witness is not just to what men are seeing, but also to yes. what God is seeing. And we should uh, live as if Jesus could come any day. Yes, please. And <laughs> Then, but it's, it is a fearful thing also because then we will stand before mm. him and give an account for of how faithful we have been to what he's mm. called us to do. And, and that, you know, Paul even says, no, having described the, the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, mm -hmm. the we fear. persuade yeah. men. Yeah. Um, he uses the word terror, but what it is, is he is living in that fearful in the right sense of the word, you know, that, that reverential anticipation mm -hmm. that he could give an account to Jesus any time. He says, my conscience is clear, but only Christ mm -hmm. knows, really. And so we are to live every day in that expectancy. I, I use the example, let's say the queen said she's going to visit your house sometime. All right, that would maybe motivate you a little bit that, you know, sometime. But if you knew she wasn't going to come for at least another 10 years. Or 2,000. It wouldn't necessarily change your, your lifestyle, would it? Well, but if the Queen said, I'm going to visit your house and it could be any time, right. then, you're, then you should, or whoever you respect highly, you should, uh, you know, live as if they might come today and, be, and be ready. My question really is for those who are just on, you know, just coming into their own as, as a Christian and probably, or even looking at this program and thinking, well, you know, we've been hearing this for thousands of years uh, that Jesus is coming soon. And you, you said that we don't know the day, the hour, but, mm. and we don't have any signs as to know when, but we, Okay, know, well, that's a different question. Yeah, it is a different question, Judge. But I just want to make that clear for those viewers that are just switching in, thinking, well, you know, if Jesus is coming back, you know, just tell me, uh, give me an idea, what are some of the uh, indications that it is in a particular yeah. time? Like Je Jesus also talked about signs. And a How generation. will we know that we will be in the end time of the church yes. age? So although he's kept it so that the rapture could be any time, yet there are signs connected with the second coming of Christ. Now, without going into great detail, mm. you've got Israel itself. Israel, the fig tree. State Israel, the fig tree, the fig tree okay. is the primary sign. Yeah. Jesus said, the fig tree, look at the fig tree and all the trees when he was asking that question. Trees are continuity signs. So in the tribulation, which is what is described in the book of Revelation, you know, from chapter six onwards, you, all the trees, whether they're evil trees or good trees, are bearing fruit, and that's called summertime. And Jesus said, you know that you're 
that that's coming near when you're in springtime, when all these trees spring up and bear leaves. Yeah, so in other words, the signs of the times which Jesus gave about nation rising against nation, food mm. shortages in one place yes. after another, earthquakes in one place after another, disobedient to parents even, all sorts of other things, like lawlessness increasing. I, I mean, believe. our prisons are full. You know, people say it's not, well, I did it. I'm sorry, but that was uh, proved to be the case that, that we are overflowing with criminals uh, and criminality. Uh, so, and you read the newspapers, I'm sorry, but it, it, the stabbings that are going on, these people that just have no respect for life at all, wantingly killing people uh, for, for no reason at all. I mean, this is an evil age that we're living in. Jesus did say this would be a rebellious uh, and lawless generation. I believe the end time started in 1914. Yep. Because that's the World War One, and when it says nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, that's a Hebrew word for world war. Mm -hmm. And so, in a sense, that's when the Braxton Hicks contraction started. But the final birth pains will be in in the tribulation. But right. the fig tree is the major sign, and Jesus said, the generation that sees this sign that is the rebirth of Israel in 1948, will not pass away. So in other words, it's certainly within a, in a man's lifetime of 1948. And Jesus emphasized that by saying, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Good. So I definitely believe we're in the last generation. Right. Yes. I just wanted to make that clear for those that are just uh, babies, as it were, in, in uh, biblical studies. Okay, uh, this is from Sue, who says, Happy birthday, Derek. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> please could you explain about the falling away at the end time? How does this fit in with the rapture? Well, there's two references to the falling away. <laughs> one, one is in, in Timothy. It does say there will be a, a falling away in the end time, uh, a falling away from the faith mm -hmm. um, as one of the last days of things. But of course, there's always been apostasy in the church right from the beginning. Um, and so it's really, again, one of the general signs of the end times is that an increase of moral evil that you referred to and an increase of apostasy in the church. But again, it's not a specific sign that you could say, oh, the apostasy has happened. You know, it's always been here, but it has increased uh, and, and so on. But the other um, one is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I don't believe that's talking about the, the apostasy at all. It's actually talking about the rapture because you can't, as I say, apostasy is not a, a specific sign. It's a, it's a general condition of things. And 2 Thessalonians 2 has been, I, I would say, mistranslated. The early, like the Tyndale translations, get it right. Because the word apostasy simply means departure. Yeah. Now in Timothy Falling it says away, departure yeah. from the faith. Mm -hmm. and it, but it could just mean departure. You see, a right. departure okay. with spiritual significance. Now, in, in 2 Thessalonians, it says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, the subject under discussion is the rapture, don't be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or word or letter as if from us, as though the day of the Lord had come. That's the, a phrase for the tribulation. That we're in the, somebody was scaremongering, and you, you'll find it on YouTube. Oh, we're in the sixth trumpet, we're in the fifth seal right now. The, the tribulation has come, the Antichrist is so and so. And he says, Don't listen to that. Because he says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the, the falling away comes first. And then the Antichrist will be revealed. He says, Don't, it, it hasn't happened because the falling away hasn't happened yet. This is the word apostasia, but what falling away? He doesn't explain it. He doesn't say the falling away from the faith. People just assume that. He says the falling away. Now, good Bible interpretation, if it doesn't specify what it is, the falling away must be in the context. And, and here it says the falling away, or let me say, as Tyndale translated it, the departure must happen first. What departure? Look in the context. What departure is, to, is he talking about? The departure of the church from the earth. He announced that in verse 1. That's the subject. So he's saying the tribulation will not come until the rapture, the, the rapture happens first. And oh, then that's confirmed later on. I see where you get that from. Okay. Yeah. And, and because <coughs> it doesn't say from the faith. And he, Paul is talking about a specific sign. But if you just say apostasy, how can you? Because there's yeah, always been fit. apostasy. Yeah. That's not a sign. And then he is conformed confirmed a bit later because he says, you know what's restraining the, the Antichrist, 
that he may be revealed in his due time. And he says, what is restraining? And then he says, he who is restraining will restrain until he is taken out of the way. Right. And then the so, Antichrist is revealed. And that mm -hmm. just agrees, you see, that there must, the restrainer, which of course must be the Holy Spirit through the church, is restraining evil. But when the church is removed, that ministry is stopped and the Antichrist can then come into his fullness. So the whole passage fits together beautifully once you understand that. Very good. Um, the, uh, this is from John. Hi, guys. I've heard it taught that as a born-again Christian, uh, we were crucified with Christ. Is there a verse in Scripture to bear this out? Yes, that's um, in, is that not in Galatians chapter 2, that we were crucified, crucified with, with Christ, Christ. nevertheless? Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, exactly where um, it is. But yeah, I could find it. I think it's Galatians 2.20, but... Uh, Somebody would Google it for us. Oh, we've got a whole audience out there. They would know where that is. But they, definitely. And there are also Romans 6 mm. talks about how we were died with Christ, we're buried died with Christ. Colossians 2 yeah. talks about that. Ephesians 2 talks about our... This is all to do with our identification with Christ. Yeah. That our old man, being. the way I interpret that is that... It's definitely our, in Scripture. Yes, here it is. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Very good. But basically, I understand this, that when Adam sinned, his spirit died, all right? Immediately. Dying you shall die. And then his body gradually died. Okay. So man is born spiritually dead. When we received Christ, we received a new birth, and our old man was crucified with Christ. Our old spirit was taken to the cross, and we received a new man in its place created out of the resurrection life of Christ himself, so that now Christ lives in me, I'm a new creation, praise God, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, and that means my old spirit is crucified with Christ, and I am now a new man in my spirit. Very good. Of course, I need to yeah. change my mind and my soul, yeah, well, and my, my body will be changed one day, but the spirit has been saved. This, first of all, let me just say uh, thank you to Pauline who <coughs> writes in and said she really uh, appreciates the Bible study uh, uh, which was uh, before. So thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, coming to the Bill. Happy birthday, uh, Bill says to Derek. Thank you. And hi to me, thanks. Uh, is the slight miscalculation in the birth year of our Lord, probably 5 BC, taking into account the end time prophecy? No, I believe it's 2 BC myself. Um, I calculate back from, there was an error, of course, but of, a, of about a year, if, if I'm yes, true. Yes, because of... But not, um, let me say a couple of things zero. about that. <laughs> I believe there's very strong proof that Christ died in AD 33. Everything lines up. The, the sun turned to darkness in AD 33. We have the Roman records for that. The moon turned to blood on that very day. What about the census? In Jerusalem. The year of the census. Well, yes, um, the, uh, that is to do, you can relate that to something in Augustus's time, in, that fits That's very right. well. Yep. Uh, Dr. Martin has explained that very well. Um, but basically, I've not heard 5 um, BC the problem with 4 and 5 BC, which has become, you'll read any of the yep. old books, it says that, because some time ago, somebody made a foolish judgment and they decided that, that Herod the Great died in 4 BC. So and therefore, had Christ be. had to be before that. Right. If you read mm. the more recent work, that has now been questioned because it's all based on a lunar eclipse. Because in Josephus, it says that there was a lunar eclipse near the time of Herod's death. There was a lunar eclipse and he died shortly after. And then shortly after that, there was a Passover. And so there are actually three candidates. One was in 4 BC, one was in 1 BC, late in 1 BC, and one was in 1 AD. And the, the 1 BC and the 1 AD candidates are much better than the 4 BC candidate. Why they chose that one, I don't know. Finnegan, which is the classic work on Bible chronology, he says, we need to forget this 4 BC date. It's, it's actually, could be 1 BC, 1 AD. So it probably uh, Herod died in 1 BC. And you can reconcile Josephus with that. So forget the 5 BC, in my opinion. Okay. Um, if you, sorry, last thing to say, if Christ did die in 33, and I believe the proof is pretty well in for that, you need to go back 33 and a half years. There is no year zero, 
and you get to Tabernacles 2 BC. Right. <coughs> All right. Um, if we could describe Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel 1 with today's knowledge, how would we describe it, asked Mark? Have you got Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1? What? Is this all of the cherubim? Um, you'd have to have a look. I left my Bible in the office, sorry. Well, I don't think... Um, I know the von Däniken had the idea that if this is the some kind of alien spacecraft, but um, you mean with the I, wheels, don't, the I don't buy the that. The wheels and fiery... Yeah. Fiery wheels I think and the eyes in it turns. Yes, that's the one, way. yes. Yeah. So Ezekiel, basically, bless him, he's struggling because he's saying, well, it's a bit like this. It's, a bit, it's nothing like he's seen before. So it's like, it's a bit like this. But it's a portable throne of God uh, that carried... It's where the spirit went, wasn't the it? The cherubim. I mean, what he was saying, really, was that the glory of the Lord was leaving the temple uh, because of all the idolatry in his time. And fornication. And, and the, the throne, this portable throne of God was coming to... And then you, he sees in other visions the glory of God leave the temple through the east side, goes up the Mount of Olives, and uh, then goes up to heaven. Just like Jesus did, by the way, because he was it's the true. glory of God. Yeah. He departed the temple. He went up the Mount of Olives, and he ascended on high from the Mount of Olives. But anyway, so how um, would you he was just today? struggling. He said, it's a bit like this, it's a bit like this. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's we would be in any better position nowadays because it's, it wasn't like he saw an alien spacecraft that we would now understand, oh, those were jets and those yeah. are... No, this is the cherubim, you know, this is God's portable throne. So I don't think we'd do much better. <laughs> better <now>. I suppose, <coughs> just thinking about it, it's a long time since I read that, mm. uh, but I would think it was showing, it shows you that, you know, the immediacy of which God can move on something Mm. And it could turn every which way. It's, it's all seeing yes, with the is. eyes and all knowing. Yeah. And it's where the spirit wants to go to deal with the different things. Yes, it's amazing. Because the, the, uh, Ezekiel would have been in Babylon, wouldn't he? Mm. So he was 500 yes. miles or so away. He was seeing it in the spirit. In the vision, yes. wasn't he? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Loads of questions coming in. Brilliant. So uh, have a small question. Read Luther, <laughs> uh, says Les. Um... I was told today by a Catholic friend who has been very forthright on the issue of the Catholic Church being the, the own, uh, or probably mm -hmm. means only true church, mm -hmm. that Luther added artificially the word alone in reference to us being saved via faith alone, as this was an intentional uh, mistranslation from the original Greek. I asked him uh, to quote me the exact verse before I get stuck into it, but maybe Derek can please throw some light on it. Uh, says Les. I know it's in Romans, but um, basically, on the one hand, technically, he added the word alone in the sense that it's not in the Greek, but it's there. It's there in the thought of the passage. Um, and translators do that. You know, they, most translations are not rigid in the terms of... So Luther wasn't cheating. He does what translators do. He, he communicates the dynamic equivalent of the meaning. If you compare it with other verses, I know it's in Romans, but I won't hazard a guess. Mm -hmm. But they will... Um, if you read the passage, it's clearly talking about faith alone. Because... Although the Catholics believe faith is a component of your salvation, they, don't, they actually believe in a mixture of faith and works and obedience to the church and receiving the sacraments. And, and it destroys the whole concept that Paul is teaching in Romans consistently. So it was fair enough for Luther to, to bring out that, that, that truth that was mm -hmm. in the passage mm -hmm. that he makes clear in a number of scriptures that our friend will have to read through Romans. But it's very clear that Rome, he says things like, if it's of faith, then it's not of works. You know, if it's, if it's of works, then it's not of grace. And he makes a very clear distinction that faith is something very distinct from works, whereas the Catholic teaching kind of melds faith and works all together. You know, but and the whole point of faith... Is that because of, of perhaps uh, James's input on that? that you, you show me th your faith well, the reason, your works. Well, the reason is, well, it is true that you need to understand James, that that's another issue, mm. that James is actually saying that it, when you believe, it is important that you add works to your faith. But put it, put well, it like this. I think it's not important. I think it's more, it's an outworking of your faith yes. because it, it's not something you think about. I think the Reformation about. thing it, is saying something you do. we are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that stays alone. Right. So if your faith, think of faith as your surrender to God. 
you're trusting in God. I dare not trust in myself at all. If I trusted in Christ 80% and 20% in my works, well, Christ isn't going to let me down. So the bottom line is I'm trusting in my own works. And the Bible says anyone who trusts in his own works is lost. Yeah. Because we have to come to the end of ourselves. We have to surrender ourselves to God Die completely to yeah. and trust in him alone. Mm. Where if we truly surrender to the Lordship of Christ in our heart, we're resting on Christ and his perfect work on the cross. That's how you're saved. Mm. Okay. And now if you have truly surrendered rather than just given lip service, that will show in your life of works, but you're not saved by those works. Mm. Does that mean then, Derek, that we have to abandon all um, planning for the future? No, but we abandon trusting in ourself. Very good. Uh, either for our salvation wise, or our life. Because yeah. he says in the gospel, the, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that the righteous by faith shall live by faith. So the same faith by which we're saved, we need to live by. We, a continual trusting in God, because it's hard for us. We, we, we tend to want to trust ourselves, but we learn to live by faith. We trust in him. But out of that, we make our plans, but we always submit them to God. And we say to God, God, if you want us to change yep. that plan, please feel free. <laughs> Very good. Um, OK, so let me did I read that one. Oh, no, I haven't read this one. Uh, when we die, do our souls go straight to heaven or hell? Or will we be asleep until Christ's return uh, when we will either live in the new earth or be cast to hell? This is from Peter from Reading. Yes, the doctrine of soul sleep is mm. basically not biblical. It's what cults tend to teach. Certain cults tend to teach. But, but it does mention it, that. The Bible in talks about sleep. He, in, the book, in the Old Testament, there's more about that sleep in death, isn't there? Yeah. I, can I mention another book of mine called yeah. the Panorama, a, a Panorama of Prophecy? I've done a, mm. which is my big book on prophecy, it's about 600 pages, again, from the website. But I do a whole chapter and I deal with all of that stuff in the Old Testament and New. And the, the New called? Testament is absolutely clear. Okay, the book's uh, called. Panora a panorama of prophecy. Okay. I've done a big chapter on life after death, mm -hmm. if people are interested in that. So in a quick but resume. I would say that when, it's, when it says believer sleeps, that's talking about the body. Our body is said to sleep, because that's God, what God's way of saying, although death seems to be final, God's going to wake our body up on the resurrection morning. And so really it's sleep, it's a temporary state of our body. But so many scriptures in the New Testament, Paul says, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which is far better. Paul says, you know, Paul died and he, in Corinthians, he went up to the third heaven and he saw amazing things. Again and again, you'll see in Revelation, in Revelation 5, you see the martyrs under the altar. They are fully conscious and they are praying. You'll see again martyrs in the Great Tribulation in Revelation 7. I could go on. There's so many scriptures of believers go straight to heaven. What about now, the two witnesses uh, in Revelation? It says that <coughs> their blood cries out as well when they were slaughtered or when they are going to be slaughtered. If their blood is. cries out. Isn't it? That's Abel. I know there's that one. In yeah. a, 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 they, they are but killed. Also, they're killed. They're killed and but then they are I resurrected. Think... Doesn't talk about their blood growing up. Oh, they're they're killed the, and then they're resurrected. Or is it and just the souls ascend. of those uh, that are, uh, the blood's crying out, of those that are slaughtered then? In, I'm sure it's in Revelation. I think you're thinking of the martyrs that I yes. re talked about in Revelation 6. Yeah. Sorry, Maybe I said 5. It, yeah. Revelation 6, that the martyrs of those who are killed in the tribulation, yeah. they're seen in heaven. Mm -hmm but they're praying right. for, for okay. justice to be done. And exactly. God says, you right. need to wait a bit until the, the, fine, the full number of martyrs is in. Right. Uh, but God will vindicate them. God will bring justice. So there, there are many verses that make that clear. So, Unbelievers go down to Hades. Right. So the, where they Peter's, Peter's the saying, where, where, <laughs> the, the time of the judgment then, uh, when some go enter into the new earth or the others that go are cast away, there's two judgments. Like if you were going in a law court today, the first one is to ascertain your guilt or innocence. The second one is to ascertain your degree of punishment right. and final sentencing, we yeah. call it. The first one happens at death. Mm -hmm. At the point of death, you either die in your sins or you die in the Lord. You either go up or you go down. That 
your, your guilt or innocence is determined at death, you know, your final mm. death. You might get res resuscitated and get another chance, but your final death, oh, your spirit goes... Then the judgment is made, because even Hades under the earth is a place of punishment, but only for the spirit or for the soul. Then, at the end of time, uh, at, well, at the resurrection, and at the end of time, you see that all the unbelievers are raised and stand before the great white throne in Revelation 20. That is not to judge them if they're innocent or guilty. That's already been decided because they miss the resurrection of the righteous. This is to decide their, uh, the degree of their punishment. Just as there are degrees of reward, there are degrees of punishment. And then they are sentenced into the lake of fire. So but there are two stages to the process. Fire? Almost, that's the eternal cutting off. Uh, that's, there's no degrees of how much you're cut off, is there? There are. Is there? The way I understand it, it says every knee will bow mm -hmm. before God in that day. But it will take, let's take someone like Satan to take the extreme case, who is in total high degree rebellion against God. Think of the pain level that will be necessary to stop him expressing his sin nature. See, this idea that hell will be a party, oh, I'll be with all my mm. friends, I'll have a great time, absolutely not. Everyone will be held at the degree of punishment necessary to restrain them from sinning. So they won't be able to express, they'll still have that sin nature because that's what they chose. They rejected their salvation, but they will be at that level of punishment that will restrain them. So, so pain, think, you know, if you got a big toothache every time mm. you started to sin, mm -hmm. that would stop you sinning, you know what I mean? So that's how God will, will actually restrain So are, there, are you saying they are somehow conscious of the fact they're in this pain or yeah. this period of cutting off? And is it till the end of the thousand years? Or is it forever? I'm sorry to say, it's an, it's an it's everlasting eternal. punishment. Okay. As, as for, for, it would be nice to believe something else, but... To me, the Bible is quite clear on that. <coughs> what will happen after the millennial kingdom um, and after Satan is cast into Gehenna, asked Marcus? Well, then there is the, this present universe will be destroyed. Uh, this is the, the end of Revelation 20 and the start of 21. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And then the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and is, is established on the earth. So in a sense, heaven and earth now come together and there's a completely new universe because this old universe is just temporary. It's corrupted by sin. God, in a sense, uses this universe to deal with the sin issue, the rebellion issue. What to do with those who rebel against their creator? You know, it can't be allowed to stand forever. God will deal with it in a relatively short period of time, although for us, 7,000 years or however long is a long period of time, but in the light of eternity, forever and ever and ever, it's just a very short window of time, God will deal with the major cosmic issue of the horror of, of man rebelling against, and angels rebelling against their creator. It'll be dealt with, and then there'll be a new heaven and new earth in which of perfect righteousness and joy and everything. So just for those uh, who would say the earth will not come to a, a final uh, horrific end mm. um, because I think there's scriptures that get used for that to support that idea in where it says the earth will not totter for indefinitely and yeah I've never understood why people would contend for that yeah. it seems because it's only just isolated God's gonna burn this particular though. universe yeah. yeah heaven and earth will pass away Jesus yeah. said and Peter um, explains it very well as well Peter is very Chapter graphic three. and and they kind of see that God will cleanse this earth but basically, um, God will do that kind of cleansing for the millennium and we'll be back to paradise in the millennium. But sin is so infested as part of this universe, God's going to destroy this whole universe uh, completely. Because even time as we know it will, will stop and we'll be into a different order altogether, I believe. Right, uh, next one. Why did... Jesus tell the Pharisees that Satan was their father. Uh, no name on that one. Uh, why did Jesus tell the Pharisees Satan was a father? He said, you from your father the, yes, the devil. Be well, because Is there lies? It's a spiritual, spiritually he's their father. In a sense, um, anyone who submits to Satan's spirit 
and the basic his spirit comes through his lie basically which is reject god and be your own god do what you want to do define your and own you will reality. not die you know yeah and yeah. Uh, follow me mm. and he made that choice which is like like i say the great cosmic evil the great cosmic issue that's over every soul there's a spiritual war for every soul is what will you choose will you choose to mm. believe and love the truth that God is your creator, he defines your reality, he defines your gender, he defines you, and you have to live by trusting in him and yielding control to him, or are you want to be your own God? And Satan's lie, of course, is God wants to hold you back. You know, be your own God. And that's the principle of the, of the kingdom of darkness. And anyone who submits to that Satan is their spiritual father, mm. and therefore they will share his same judgment. Uh, from Cynthia, um, in Revelation 6, verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the <coughs> fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them who were slain yeah. for the word of God and their testimony which they held. And verse 10, And they cried out with a loud voice. That's what I was saying earlier. Yeah. Um, how long, O Lord, how long, holy and how true, uh, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them who dwell on the earth? Yeah, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. yeah. Could you explain why these souls are crying out for revenge uh, when we are told to forgive those who persecute us? Sorry to laugh there. Uh, also, what is the altar uh, that the souls are underneath and what does it mean? Yeah. Um, well, they're, so in, they're in heaven under the altar. It kind of represents the fact that they, been they gave their life, they yeah. were sacrificed. Yeah. I think, like I said, they're crying out for justice. Mm. It's like Abel's judge, yeah. you know. It's not wrong, justice is right, you know. If a murderer commits an evil sin, it is right that they are brought to justice. And so we, there is this prayer. When we pray even, your kingdom come. We're praying for Jesus to return, but we're Amen. also yeah. praying for him to judge evil. Yeah. And that's what they're doing. They're praying that he, God will judge evil. You know, it's above our pay grade. All we can do is, is pray. But we, we, if you are dealt with harshly, one of the, the comforts, in a way, that one day, if it's not in this life, God will vindicate. Mm. And, and we leave, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That doesn't mean God isn't going to do anything about it. He will, and he will vindicate. And they're praying for that, and it is a righteous prayer. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, Jeff writes in, fantastic show. Uh, I hope the rapture isn't tonight. <laughs> Howard, uh, that lovely new scarf would be blown away, says Jeff. <laughs> I've got a cold, as you can probably tell, and it's, I'm just trying to keep myself, I was from losing entirely my voice. I was speaking down there for a week. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get anything higher than that. And I'm just come up another octave at the moment. Right, okay, hi folk. Last week, just a minute, posed the question about wives being submissive to their husband. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, I don't want my wife to be that way. We are both equal and share everything. Am I breaking God's law? Good question. Yes. I think every <laughs> couple, you know, finds, finds their way. But there is a model that we have, yeah. that Christ to love the church. And, what, and when it says submissive, it isn't like obey, yeah, like children like... obey their parents. It's a different word. One thing is to reverence. It kind of means to reverence and respect. But it's balanced. And with there the is an authority. It's not like an absolute it? authority. Yeah. But there is a leadership mm. that a man is meant to take. I mean, my wife and I, we, we always try and get agreement if we can. But, you know, occasionally there are situations where a decision has to be made and we discuss it and... You know, and she wins. <laughs> no, she, I always a, say I have a, the last word, she, she, and it's yes, dear. She's listening, so I need to say this. She's a wonderful <laughs> wife, and she yeah. is she is a she's a strong character, yeah. but she is a submissive wife, and and she will you know if it comes to that, mm. like when we're at Bible school, it's like I wanted to go another year, and she natural instinct was to go want to go home after two years, and. And, and I really had it in my heart to get stay the third year, and she submitted there, and she struggled a bit with that. But soon enough, the Lord bless showed her. her that was right. Yeah, so her. there are times yeah. when a decision has to be made, and somebody has to take the leadership. Yeah. So 
it, it isn't talking about a heavy domination. No, it, 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 because it's balanced with the other scriptures which says it's your, to love your wife as your own flesh. Yes, and submit um, to one another. Yes. There's a two-way yes. thing as well. But it is, it is clear, um, but let me just, who is it is written in? I don't know if there's a name there, but it is very clear in scripture that the man's role is to be the head of the yes, household. There isn't a total equality, no. but it's, it, there is an equality of person yeah. It's like the, the Godhead. You know, the Father is the head of the Son. Mm -hmm. there, is, uh, there is an order even between the Father yeah. and the Son, but they are equal. It's like Christ is the head of the church. They're and equally we God. We have to submit to him. Yes. And yet and we're so the bride. There is a thing So there is authority. a female male yeah. situation. There is a difference. Yeah. But you know, I mean, this day and age, that has definitely eroded away and, uh, mm. because of the emancipation of women. But that's something which I believe is right on time because that spirit of anti-man has to come about, I think, before the Lord returns, because it's a, a part, if you like, the signs of the times of our disobedience to biblical principles. Mm. So, yeah, okay. Hi, folks, last week, oh yeah, that's it, I read that one. Uh, good question, though. I hope you have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, hi, Derek, happy birthday. Uh, I've been, following the, this Revelation 12 and 23rd September as well. Uh, now then, I saw a video that told you to go to Google Sky and type in Constellation and search for Virgo. I did that and put infrared on the site. Uh, what I saw then was a red dragon-like creature uh, blanked out. Why is this blanked out um, on the Google Sky? Why are they trying to hide it? I sent a pic here, if you can see it. Um, yeah. Well, well, they, there is a, there is a, there is a dragon-like constellation. I'm not sure if it's Draco or Serpens. I'm not sure nearby, but it's a standard thing. It, it's true for any date of the year. You you have a, a serpent constellation, but it's. I don't think it, there's anything sinister there. It's probably just the way the the program works. But as it says in Revelation 12, it the dragon was nearby to to swallow the child, and there is a constellation, a very large one, nearby that is does, um, near Virgo. Does that mean anything to you? I just uh, brought that up from uh, the link that... That doesn't say anything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's just a picture of galaxies. I don't know whether... Okay. Well, okay. Anyways, bless you. I don't think it. there's anything sinister there. I've got to get back to Google. I do, uh, not Google. <laughs> How do I get back to my emails, kid? The dragon is there at all times. Yeah. Okay, I've really blown it now. How do I get back? Can I just mention that our program is on at... Um, yeah, Tuesdays. Uh, that's the no, repeat. Wednesday. Yes, Wednesdays at 8.30. While you're looking at Yeah, that's it. Go on. Wednesdays at 8.30 in the evening, and then it's repeated on Tuesday mornings at 10 okay. in the morning. How do I get back to my emails, <laughs> Miss, Mrs. Producer? It's going anywhere else, but that's going to a Facebook now. Anyway, what, do you want to come in and get this? And I'll talk about, I'll put Delis, Delis, Derek on the spot with somebody else. It's only a one woman person here tonight <laughs> amongst two men. Um, so whilst um, Bethany comes and gets that, I just wanted to ask you this because there's so much on the news. Nearly every single day, whether it's a, a live uh, radio program or, or whatever, mm. talking about Brexit. I mean, we mm. are in a real mess right now, are we not? Well, it's, it's impossible to predict what will come of it. But I'm a, personally, I'm a great believer in Brexit for spiritual reasons. And the thing is the EU is notoriously difficult to negotiate with, uh, as the Greeks found out. Yeah. So it may be whether we like, like it or not, you know, it will be a, a hard Brexit. But uh, to, to me, the important thing is not, I'm sure God will see us through it, and, but the important thing is that we're set free from the principality of Europe, which is the center of humanistic evil in the world. And that's been driving our laws and um, our, you know, so to be set free from it is a vital part of what I believe will be a coming revival. But we need to be clear from those, uh, those powers that are actually controlling our nation. This is something you don't hear on the arguments that are put no. forward. Uh, and I've often felt like I want to ring in, and talk, but I just know that it just don't cast your pearl before swine. Yeah. Because it, it seems to be that there's a complete split and there's a 
this total disregard for democracy actually working because mm. it's a democratic vote, whether yeah. it was right or wrong, the democracy is there. And just like those shocks that can come in the middle of a program, yeah. um, it is something which is going to be continuous till, till the day we actually do uh, mm. exit. Uh, we need to recover our national confidence as a nation and, not, and feel that, you know, and that we are a Christian nation and we need to recover our heritage. And I think for God to use us as a nation again, we really need to get back to our call and destiny as a nation and not feel like, oh, we're useless on our own. We have to become part of some bigger thing, you know. I think we, we should embrace who we are as a nation. Right. Let me see if we get a few, uh, th a th a few more in. Uh, just really quick answers. Sure. Hello, friends. Have you heard of the uh, Admittisberg prophecy of the two sons? Jesus said in the gospel, the power of the heavens will be shaken, the cosmic upheaval event uh, that will cleanse the earth, says John. No. Heard, no? Well, that was a quick answer. Yeah. No, we haven't heard that one, John. Sorry, we haven't got time to even look into that. <laughs> Could you please explain the role of the so-called end-time martyrs in the run-up to the parousia, uh, the coming of the Lord, in Revelation 6, says Brian. Revelation 5 again, isn't it? Yeah. No, well, Revelation 6. six yeah. yeah. Well, those, those martyrs are reveal. Each seal reveals, basically, the seals represent God taking his hand of grace off a different area like whether it's the economic area, the political area, and so on. And so one of the things of the tribulation is God takes his restraining hand off moral evil. And so in, the, in that case, and, Rev and the sixth seal is, is, you know, God takes his hand off the natural order, so there's earthquakes and all kinds of stuff. So the moral evil is released, as Jesus described in great detail, that the, the lawlessness will increase. And part of that is those martyrdoms. So it's a revelation of what's going to happen in the tribulation, um, that God takes his hand of mercy off the nation, off the nations. And it's, that's why it's going to be such a terrible time. Uh, quick one. Was the ministry of uh, Jesus three years or less? Three and a half years. Thank you. The Gospel of John shows right. that. Okay. <coughs> uh, there's a uh, very interesting email here. Um, very, very quickly, this is... Uh, Someone who says uh, that uh, the Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20 is her favorite reading. And she's going to be having a, a funeral because she's seriously ill. God oh, bless you, okay. sister. Um, uh, to, uh, to both Kath, uh, okay, you're so fortunate to be living near C.S. Lewis's church here. He's my <laughs> mentor. Yeah. have been there many times before. Um, he was ill also. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm trying to read this. C.S. Yes, Lewis is yeah. one of the famous Oxford yeah. people. Oh, yes. Bless you. Uh, may the Lord uh, give you uh, every blessing possible mm. uh, as you yes. pass from this life uh, into the new life in Jesus' name. It's hard to say. It's going to be good. It? It's going to be good. Do you know? This life hasn't got that it's much to offer. It really hasn't. It's just for the real thing. You know, I could, I, I'm starting to recognize what my mum said to me in our final days was, I'm tired, son. I want to go. Mm. Isn't it? And, uh, you know, uh, and I'm already feeling like that. <laughs> I'm nowhere near her age. But I just want to say thank you so much uh, to Pastor Derek Walker, of course, coming and all this way from his... Uh, native Oxford, Oxford. Uh, and also for coming and answering your questions. You're always so faithful uh, as viewers to be able to put the, the good, great questions to our guests. And uh, we'll be having Derek on again, hopefully in the very near future. But meanwhile, uh, just uh, stay tuned, but stay tuned to God because this is a very interesting time. It's not a time to be fearful and not a time to be fearful of death because you know what is coming as promised by the Lord is going to come to full fruition, I believe in the coming years. Thank you so much indeed. God bless you, take care of yourself. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Night night.